I, I heard um, Snoop told the story a few times, but he had it. He had it wrong. Many rappers have fond memories of Tupac, and they are not afraid to share them any chance they get. Snoop Dogg is no exception, as they were both signed to Death Row Records. One of the stories that Snoop has recently shared about Tupac has rubbed Nas the wrong way, forcing Nas to give Snoop a reality check. The incident occurred during an award show and almost turned into a gun battle. So what really happened? Nas checked Snoop Dogg. The year was 1996, and the hip-hop landscape was ablaze with fierce regional rivalries. The East Coast and West Coast were locked in a battle for dominance, with tensions running high whenever artists from both coasts were gathered under the same roof. One such occasion was the 1996 MTV Video Music Awards held at the iconic Radio City Music Hall. It was a night filled with anticipation, but little did anyone know that it would also be the setting for a tense encounter between two rap heavyweights, Tupac Shakur and Nas. Snoop Dogg, who was present at the event, vividly recalls the atmosphere that night. As the artists mingled and the crowd buzzed with excitement, there was an underlying tension in the air. The East Coast-West Coast rivalry had reached its peak, and every interaction threatened to detonate. Nas, known for his lyrical prowess and representing the East Coast, didn't have a large entourage with him that night. However, he had a group of armed friends who were ready to defend him at a moment's notice. Snoop recalls seeing them with their hands on their guns, a clear sign that they were prepared for any confrontation. Nas didn't have a lot of people with him, but he had a lot of people with him, if you know what I'm saying. They were strapped, ready to protect him. I'm seeing them with their hands on their guns, Snoop revealed in an interview with radio host Angie Martinez. According to Snoop, despite the tension in the room, Nas approached Tupac, a West Coast icon known for his raw energy and unapologetic lyrics. Nas introduced himself as a big fan of Tupac's music, hoping to bridge the gap between the two coasts. He told him how much he admired his music, but Pac wasn't having it. He made it clear that he wasn't messing with any East Coast rappers. He even mentioned how he dissed him, Biggie, and Jay-Z on a song. Despite Tupac's hostility, Hostility, Nas remained determined to spread love and squash the beef. He embraced Tupac, hugging him tightly and assuring him that he would never diss him. The encounter between Tupac and Nas at the 1996 VMAs was a moment that encapsulated the intense rivalry between the East Coast and West Coast. It was a clash of egos and musical styles, with both artists standing their ground. Little did they know that this encounter would be etched in hip-hop history. However, Nas had a different version of events. During a recent interview, he addressed the long-standing rumors and controversy surrounding his alleged beef with the late Tupac Shakur. Snoop Dogg had previously shared his version of events, but according to Nas, there were some significant discrepancies. I heard Snoop told the story a few times, but he had it wrong a little bit, Nas began. He had said that Pac stepped to me, rest in peace Pac, but he was in New York and there was a lot of tension flaring. So what really happened that night? To understand the events that took place on September 4th, 1996, during the VMAs, it is important to put everything into context. Nas, hailing from Queensbridge, New York, was riding high on the success of his album It Was Written released in July of that year. The album showcased Nas's lyrical prowess and storytelling abilities, solidifying his status as one of the top rappers in the game. One of the standout tracks from the album was If I Ruled the World, featuring Lauryn Hill, which became an instant classic. As one of the top artists representing New York and the entire East Coast, Nas was scheduled for a surprise performance at the MTV Awards. The anticipation surrounding his appearance was palpable, as fans eagerly awaited his stage presence alongside the Fugees, who were also at the height of their success. Meanwhile, on the West Coast, Pac was making waves with his undeniable talent and larger-than-life persona. Fresh off the release of his hit song, California Love, Pac was dominating the charts and solidifying his position as the biggest artist in music, not just in rap. With two number one albums, Me Against the World and All Eyes on Me, under his belt, Pac was a force to be reckoned with. However, Pac's success came with his fair share of controversy. The rap game was in the midst of a media-fueled East Coast-West Coast beef, and the rapper found himself at the center of it all. His infamous diss track, Hit Em Up, released on June 4th, 1996, took aim at several East Coast artists, including Nas and his close associates, Mob Deep. This diss track drew a clear line in the sand, forcing artists to pick sides and escalating tensions between the coasts. Nas, who had been enjoying a successful year with It Was Written, felt the weight of Pac's words and the disrespect aimed at his fellow Queensbridge rappers. As the MTV Awards approached, the anticipation for Nas's surprise performance grew, especially among his loyal fan base. The event was not only a chance for Nas to showcase his talent, but also an opportunity to represent New York and the East Coast in the face of the ongoing beef. In the weeks leading up to the awards show, security was a top priority for all artists involved. Suge Knight, the CEO of Death Row Records, made sure his artists had ample protection. However, Tupac had different plans. In August, he requested no further personal security services from Death Row, opting instead to rely on his own crew and a group of homeboys from New Jersey. Two of Tupac's outlaw members, Napoleon and Hussein Fatal, were tasked with gathering their Jersey goons to beef up security. 
Napoleon's crew arrived at the hotel where Death Row was staying, armed with a bag full of guns. Surprisingly, their crew was so large that they filled a full city bus, followed by a line of cars. Upon their arrival, Tupac's crew informed them that they couldn't all attend the award show due to limited space. However, they were welcome to wait in the rooms and enjoy the amenities, ordering whatever they desired. And that's exactly what they did. The rooms turned into a party scene with food, champagne, and everything else they could get their hands on. Before heading out of his room, Tupac decided to gift Fatal his death row chain and a Rolex to wear to the award show. It was a symbol of camaraderie and loyalty among the crew. With the preparations complete, Tupac and his crew made a stop to pick up Snoop Dogg. Now, with the death row stars together, they split up into separate limos. Snoop and Suge Knight rode with a security guard, while Tupac, the outlaws, and the Jersey goons got into their own limo. Tupac, with his signature bandana and a pair of duos on his feet, exuded confidence and charisma. Snoop, fresh off beating a murder case with a not guilty verdict, had a newfound focus to take the rap game by storm once again. Both artists were at the pinnacle of their careers, with Tupac being the biggest artist in music, not just in rap. As they made their way through the entrance, the entourage stood waiting, ready to take on the night. Tupac, known for his magnetic personality, couldn't resist engaging with the press, taking photos, and giving interviews. The energy was electric, and the anticipation for the award show was at an all-time high. Little did they know, the events that were about to unfold would forever etch this night in the annals of hip-hop history. Inside, Nas and his crew made their way backstage to prepare for their surprise performance. Meanwhile, Tupac, accompanied by the Outlaws and the Jersey Goons, also headed backstage, ready to present an award with Snoop Dogg for Best Hard Rock Video. And there, in the backstage chaos, Nas and Tupac crossed paths. Nas, showing respect for Tupac's presence, said, Do your thing. Tupac, equally acknowledging Nas, replied, And you do yours. It was a brief exchange, but little did they know that it would be a pivotal moment in their tumultuous relationship. While Nas and Tupac had their brief encounter, something else was brewing at the bar. Jungle, Nas's brother, found himself engaged in a conversation with a beautiful lady who claimed to be there with Death Row waiting for them. Jungle, always ready to defend his family and crew, boasted about snatching a Death Row chain, which was considered a threat. This only added fuel to the fire that was about to erupt. News of Jungle's declaration at the bar quickly reached Tupac's ears. Immediately, he went over to confront the group Jungle was with, demanding to know who made the threat. Jungle, not one to back down, admitted, I said I'll take one of y'all chains. It's Queensbridge in the house. The tension escalated as Gaddafi, another member of Tupac's crew, pulled out two razors declaring, this is death row. I'm here to die. What's good? Napoleon, always ready to defend his crew, also jumped in. Security quickly intervened, grabbing Tupac and pulling him away from the escalating situation. Both parties exchanged heated words, but fortunately, the situation didn't escalate further. Suge Knight, the ever-present figure, stepped in, urging everyone to calm down and get back to the reason they were there, the MTV Awards. Nas, who had just finished his performance, witnessed the aftermath of the confrontation as Jungle filled him in on what had transpired. Upset at the thought of his brother almost getting jumped, Nas rallied all his goons from Queensbridge, ready to confront Tupac and Death Row if necessary. With tension still high, Nas and his crew headed back to the awards show to represent New York and the East Coast. They were determined to stand their ground and ensure that their presence was felt. The moment arrived. The Best Rap Video category was announced and Tupac's California Love was nominated alongside other hits like Doing It by LL Cool J, Gangsta's Paradise by Coolio, and Thay Crossroads by Bone Thugs and Harmony. Unfortunately, Tupac didn't walk away as the winner with the award going to Coolio for Gangsta's Paradise. Despite the disappointment, the night was far from over. However, as the night progressed, Tupac's plans took an unexpected turn. He no longer felt the urge to attend the after party. The rest of the Jersey goons who had come to support him were waiting at the hotel. Feeling obligated to show them a good time, Tupac decided to take them all to the after party. With limited transportation options, Tupac made the decision for everyone to walk to the after party, just a few blocks away from their hotel. As they made their way through the New York streets, they encountered fans and poor people, generously giving them money along the way. Finally, they arrived at the after party held at Bryant Park in Manhattan. The event was a star-studded affair, with celebrities and music industry insiders enjoying the night. Little did they know that the clash between Nas and Tupac was about to take center stage. And there, in the midst of the party, Nas's crew spotted Tupac and his crew. The tension was palpable as both sides stared each other down, ready for whatever may come. The confrontation between Nas and Tupac was about to unfold, and the world would witness a clash that would go down in hip-hop history. The Confrontation 
As the intense standoff between Nas and Tupac continued, Death Row East noticed that Tupac was surrounded by Nas's crew and quickly made their way into the mix. The Queensbridge goons stood right behind Nas and Jungle, ready to defend their brother and their honor. Despite being outnumbered, Nas's crew was mostly strapped, ready to go to war if necessary. The atmosphere was charged with anticipation, as each person waited for a sign from Tupac or Nas to set things off. However, in the midst of the surrounding armies, something unexpected happened. Tupac and Nas stepped towards each other, engaging in a conversation that would change the course of their relationship. Nas asked Tupac why he dissed Mob Deep and if he had also dissed him. Tupac admitted to dissing Mob, a deep because they had been dissing him at their shows in Atlanta and Chicago. He explained that he had to represent the West Coast against anyone dissing them from the East Coast. Nas, understanding the situation, told Tupac to stop going at Mob Deep because it wasn't even a real beef. He emphasized that it was unnecessary and that they should focus on making money together. In that moment, a surprising turn of events occurred. Tupac and Nas embraced, declared that they would put their differences aside and collaborate to create something powerful. The tension dissipated and the energy shifted from confrontation to unity. Both artists recognized the importance of coming together and showing the world that there was no real beef between the East and West Coast. They understood that their collaboration could transcend the music industry and make a positive impact. With the peace made, the atmosphere at the after party began to change. The tension that had filled the air slowly dissipated, replaced by a sense of camaraderie and celebration. NASA's crew, the Queensbridge goons and Death Row East started to mingle, exchanging stories and laughter as the night took on a new tone. The MTV Awards had come to an end, and the time had come for everyone to go their separate ways. Tupac and his crew, along with the Jersey goons, made their way back to the hotel. The energy was still high, but the focus had shifted. The night had been eventful, and the resolution between Nas and Tupac marked a turning point in their relationship. In the days that followed, the news of the resolution between Nas and Tupac spread like wildfire. Fans and industry insiders were shocked by the unexpected expected turn of events. The media buzzed with speculation and analysis as everyone tried to make sense of what had transpired. Nas, true to his word, removed any mention of Tupac from his diss track against all odds. He made it clear that he wanted to move forward and focus on unity rather than perpetuating the beef. Unfortunately, Tupac's life was tragically cut short on September 13, 1996, just days after the MTV Awards. His untimely death shook the music industry and left a void that could never be filled. The East Coast-West Coast beef had claimed its first casualty. So how had this beef even begun? And what happened the night Tupac died? The hip-hop world was divided by a fierce rivalry between the East Coast and West Coast scenes. The tension between these two coasts had been simmering for years, fueled by a sense of regional pride and competition. But it was the beef between Bad Boy Records and Death Row Records that would take this rivalry to a whole new level. Hip-hop music and culture is widely considered to have originated on the East Coast, specifically in New York City. The East Coast rappers, with their gritty lyrics, and boom bap beats were often perceived as feeling superior to other regional hip hop cultures. On the other hand, the West Coast had developed an inferiority complex as they felt overlooked and underestimated. By the late 1980s, however, the West Coast hip hop scene was flourishing, led by acts such as NWA from Compton, California. Their raw and unapologetic style resonated with audiences and they became a force to be reckoned with in the industry. This newfound success only fueled the rivalry between the coasts as the West Coast artists aimed to prove themselves against the perceived dominance of the East Coast. In 1991, the tension between the coasts reached a boiling point when Bronx rapper Tim Dogg released his album Penicillin on Wax. The album contained several skits that mocked West Coast artists, particularly the members of NWA, including Dr. Dre one track in particular titled F Compton took direct aim at the West Coast scene. This diss track, although not directly related to the beef between Bad Boy and Death Row, set the stage for what was to come. That same year, Suge Knight, a native of Compton and a Blood Gang member, co-founded Death Row Records in Los Angeles. Alongside Dr. Dre, Knight aimed to establish Death Row as a powerhouse in the West Coast hip-hop scene. Knight was among those in the West Coast hip-hop community who were irritated by the perceived condescension from the East Coast. Meanwhile, on the East Coast, a young Sean Combs had a vision of creating a New York centered hip-hop label that would rival the dominance of the West Coast. In 1993, Combs founded Bad Boy Records, and the following year, the label's debut releases by Biggie and Long Island-based rapper Craig Mack became immediate critical and commercial successes. In 1994, New York-born, California-based rapper Tupac Shakur had released two successful albums and starred in three movies. However, his career was in jeopardy as he faced financial struggles and stood trial in New York City on charges of sexual abuse, sodomy, and weapons possession. On November 30th, 1994, a pivotal event occurred that would forever change the course of the beef between Bad Boy and Death Row. Tupac was shot five times and robbed while in New York. As he was taken out on a stretcher, Tupac gave the middle finger to Big 
Biggie and other Bad Boy affiliates who were present. This incident would become a turning point in the beef as Tupac implied in an interview that Biggie and Puff were involved in or responsible for the attack at Quad Studios. Between the time of the interview and its publication, Puff Daddy visited Tupac at Rikers Island and assured him that Bad Boy was not involved in the shooting. However, the damage had been done and Tupac's trust in his former friends was shattered. The events at Quad Studios, coupled with the perceived similarities between Biggie's album and Tupac's upcoming release, fueled the fire of animosity between the two artists and their respective record labels. In February 1995, a B-side track from Biggie's Big Papa single was released. The track was titled Who Shot Ya? And although Biggie and Puff Daddy denied any connection to the shooting at Quad Studios, Tupac interpreted the song as a direct taunt aimed at him. The lyrics and timing of the release only fueled Tupac's belief that Biggie and Bad Boy were involved in the attack. As the feud continued to gain momentum, the tension between the East Coast and West Coast, hip-hop scenes reached a boiling point at the 1995 Source Awards in New York City. Suge Knight, the co-founder of Death Row Records, took the stage and made a bold statement that further ignited the rivalry. Any artist out there want to be an artist and want to stay a star and don't want to, don't want to have to worry about the executive producer trying to be all in the video, all on the record, dancing, come to Death Row. That was a direct shot at Puff Daddy. However, he took the stage and instead of clapping back at Death Row, he extended an olive branch. He delivered a message of unity and called for an end to the East Coast versus West Coast divide. I'm the executive producer that a comment was made about a little bit earlier. But con check this out. Contrary to what other people may feel, I would like to say that I'm very proud of Dr. Dre of Death Row and Shook Knight for their accomplishment. However, Puff Daddy's plea for peace fell on deaf ears, as the feud had taken on a life of its own. The tension in the room was palpable, and it was clear that the feud between Bad Boy and Death Row had transcended the personal beef between Tupac and Biggie. The divide between the coasts was becoming more pronounced, and artists and fans were taking sides. The crowd booed again when Dr. Dre was named Producer of the Year. These public denouncements and confrontations only added fuel to the fire. The media sensationalized the feud, and fans eagerly awaited the next diss track or verbal jab from either side. The East Coast versus West Coast. Rivalry had become a spectacle, with the entire hip-hop community caught up in the drama. Suge Knight took action to further solidify Death Row's alliance with Tupac. Knight secured Tupac's release from prison by posting his $1.4 million bond. He flew across the country and rented a limousine to pick up Tupac from Clinton Correctional Facility. With Tupac now a free man, he wasted no time in joining Knight in escalating the feud with Bad Boy Records. Tupac unleashed a series of diss tracks aimed at Biggie, Bad Boy, and their affiliates. Songs like the infamous Hit Em Up were filled with venomous lyrics and threats. Tupac's lyrics were shocking and explicit, leaving no doubt about his anger and desire for revenge. On September 7, 1996, the feud reached its peak of disaster. Tupac Shakur, the face of Death Row Records, was in Las Vegas for the Mike Tyson vs. Bruce Seldon boxing match. After the fight, Tupac and his entourage got into a physical altercation with a member of a rival gang. This incident only added fuel to the fire of the all already heated feud. Later that night, as Tupac and his crew were driving through the streets of Las Vegas, a white Cadillac pulled up alongside their car. Gunshots rang out, and Tupac was struck multiple times. He was rushed to the hospital, where he fought for his life for six days before succumbing to his injuries on September 13, 1996. The loss of Tupac sent shockwaves through the hip-hop community and marked a tragic turning point in the beef between Bad Boy and Death Row. And only a few months later, Biggie was also shot and killed. Nas, deeply affected by Tupac's passing, mourned the loss of a fellow artist and friend. He continued to make music, using his platform to advocate for unity and peace in the rap community. The resolution between Nas and Tupac served as a reminder that even in the midst of intense rivalries, there was always a possibility for reconciliation and growth. And so, the clash between Nas and Tupac at the MTV Awards became a defining moment in hip-hop history. It was a moment that showcased the power of unity and the potential for artists to rise above their differences. The impact of that night would resonate for years to come, leaving an indelible mark on the rap industry. One can only wonder what the rap scene would have evolved to if Death Row and Bad Boy Records had come together and reconciled just like Nas and Tupac did. If you enjoyed this video, click on the boxes playing on your screen to watch similar content.